All right, uh, let's just start. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is the Rust Berlin Meetup, the second one in this wonderful new office. I'm really glad that you're all here. Um, we have two talks today. Uh, the first is Avid, who talks about application cont container deployment for the Internet of Things with Rust, um, which is really exciting. Then we have a five minutes break, um, and then Vincent will talk about our step back and what it takes to make a BDD test framework in Rust, which is also really exciting. <laughs> um, if you want to do a talk, please reach out to me um, via personal communication or you know email or, or message on Meetup or in any way you like. Um, if you're not sure if it's good, we can we can talk about it and we can like work something out. I'm I'm sure it's good. Um, there's also the Rust Tech and Learn, which is our co-learning group, which is kind of in cooperation with Open Tech School, and I can totally recommend you to go there. It's every second Wednesday, so it would be today, but we're having the Rust meetup, so that's why it's not today. So that it means it's next in two weeks from now, uh, in this office in the community space at 7 p.m. So feel free to come there, and that we, it's like a open hacking learning session where you can just work on Rust stuff and get stuff explained from other people or explain stuff to other people. Um, last but not least, we have a code of conduct and we're ready to enforce it. So um, if you notice anything, if somebody isn't treating you as they should, please reach out to me or reach out to Valerie, who is our um, security person. Or I, can, I can get you in touch if you would like to talk to a woman. Um, and we will handle it. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Um, OK, I'll give over to Avid for the first talk. Thanks. Thank you, Johan. Let me just get set it up, set up here. I have Linux on my laptop, so it's gonna take a while to wake up. Yeah, there you go. It was actually instantaneous. Okay, great it works. Cool, so hey, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming, I'm Arvid. I'm the um, CTO of Superscale Networks and um, also founder of Corhal. I'm gonna today talk about Corhal.io, um, a project dedicated to liberating the internet of things. I'm gonna introduce Arkan and Bolter today, two of our projects that we're, that we're working on. I need to get closer to this. Um, which I just got la working last week, so if, if the demos are broken, please bear with me. You know, that that's the usual thing people say, then they break. But I, I tested them to more, uh, today, so. <laughs> cool, so let's get started on this. So, um, since I'm gonna talk about, a lot about the Internet of Things today, I just wanna um, get something out of the way. When I talk about Internet of Things, um, th there's something specific I mean by that, and uh, so it's important to get the perspective of that. There's, it's certainly interesting to get um, deployments working or applications de uh, deployments and system deployments working on small computers, but that's not what I'm going to talk to about today about. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, much smaller and cheaper devices, specifically things like edge gateways um, or gateway devices. Um, we, I call them embedded. Um, also, things like small uh, consumer devices, like the Amazon Echo, if you have one. Those are those are devices that I put in the middle. And then we have constraint devices on the on the far right of the picture, which are something like sensor nodes, things like that. They don't even run Linux, so it's important to understand that this is this is IoT. Uh, when I talk about that, it's it's not about Raspberry Pis. Um, let's do a test. So. Um, so to see a test to see if everyone's awake. Not just kidding. Um, let's do a test. Raise your hands if you know that WPA2, the Wi-Fi encryption, is broken. That's a lot of educated people. I'm I'm really glad I don't have to explain that. Um, now um, we do something more harder. Raise your hands if all of your devices in your home, including your router, your phone, your toaster, your light bulbs, are updated. That's absolutely no one. Let's face it, we have an update problem in IoT, and it's dramatic. So um, what, what I mean by dramatic is take the Mirai um, botnet, which, is, which took down a million telecom routers in 2016 and almost broke the internet. It, it took down GitHub. Um, it runs on, 
I think IP cameras, yeah, something like that. And these IP cameras don't get any updates anymore. And I'm not even gonna talk about things like, I mean, it's just IP cameras, you could think, right? But we also have other IT devices which are much more critical, things like nuclear power plants. But we're not gonna talk about that today because um, as we say in Germany, ein Teil dieser Antwort würde die Bevölkerung verunsichern. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with that. So now let me try to explain what I'm, a part of what I'm doing with Core Hall. It is essentially a solution to some of the problems that I've been seeing in the last 15 years working on embedded devices, or embedded internet connected devices specifically. If you work in embedded devices, um, you know that our tool chains are terribly broken. Um, you, we're to look with envy at uh, web developers. We've got things like Docker, we've got things like great IDs and, and great languages. I mean, not that JavaScript's great, but you know, other languages. <laughs> specifically engineered for web developers, which are which are great. There's a vast ecosystem out there. With embedded devices, we're pretty much stuck with printfc debugging and uh, a screwdriver, if you're lucky. Um, so it's not great. Until Rust came along. Rust really um, gave me hope that um, someone is designing an ecosystem that's actually going to work on, on embedded and constrained systems. And what I'm gonna what I'm gonna present now is is my part in in that ecosystem, um, in the hope that someday we're gonna have tools in in embedded that are actually equal in quality to what we have in embedded in, in web development. I'm gonna keep this rather short today. Um, there's a whole bunch of things we do with Corehall, but um, I'm only gonna talk about Arkin and Bolter, which are um, fairly interesting things. And as I said, they work unlike um, what we're planning, for example, with a crypto incentivized edge network, which doesn't work yet, so I'm not gonna talk about that yet. Specifically, Archon is, um, in its use case, very similar to um, to Docker. It allows you to, to, just, to just store a bunch of files in an image, and you can deploy that image as a single file. Unlike Docker, it, though, it doesn't use layers. Docker uses layers. Um, what we do is we use a content addressable storage. I'm gonna explain what that is. A content addressable storage is very similar to what you think Dropbox will hopefully do, or a similar service. Uh, instead of indexing data like your file system does by name, it indexes it by content, or by the address of the content uh, supplied by its hash. So imagine you and me both have a music library on Dropbox or a similar storage service. Um, we're both kind of storing um, a heavy MP3 there in, in my picture. And um, now what, what you think is heavy and what I think is heavy might be different. I think your music is rather lame. So they're going to be different, although you, we both call them heavy, right? But we can kind of both agree that Taylor Swift is cool. So we both store the same file and Dropbox or a similar service can figure out that there is the same file based on their content and can store only one of those. So in those picture of four files, but Dropbox is only going to store three and give us both a reference to one of these files. This is content addressable storage. It's not new. Some of you will probably know what it is. Just explaining here for context. Leading me to update safety on embedded. Update safety means that um, if we screw up anything on a device during update, and I've screwed up things, um, we need to be able to undo this. Because um, user interaction with devices, with embedded devices that are out there, with IoT devices, is really expensive. If you think of sending one fridge might be okay, but sending back a millions of fridges, it's gonna be bankrupting a company. company. Um, think of something like Dieselgate. Would have been a lot less costly if Volkswagen was like Tesla and just had remote updates. But then they would be kind of cooler in the first place, so. On embedded systems, um, we can do uh, various things for update safety. Um, so update safety in this case means, again, being able to roll back versions that don't work. Typically what we do is called dual systems, so we just put two versions of the same system on it, and if one has a bug or something, we just boot the other one. Um, sometimes what people do is called a fat bootloader, they just put the update capabilities inside the bootloader, so that you have a way, if your system breaks, your bootloader can still update your system. That means you're putting the updater in the region of the memory that isn't updated. You can get yourself why that meant a bad idea. This is actually what Android does. It's really, really complicated. What I'm proposing to do is, is um, doing updates with content addressable storage. This is, again, not new. We've tried this before, didn't work. I'll tell you why. Um, what you do there is you take both systems, both versions of the systems like we did before, but in instead of storing them separately as full systems, we just store the part that changed. You see, when we do system updates on embedded, 
uh, we do really big changes. Sometimes we just do a little bit of tweaking and then we need to store the whole thing. That's really inefficient. It's also network inefficient. We do know how to share code. I mean, we do how to know how to make multi-call binaries. This is something we do, for example, with BusyBox on Embedded. It's kind of like your shell toolkit and stuff like that, just in one binary. Um, now, that, that, that we know. Um, we also learned how content addressable storage can be done. Uh, we do this with Archon. And now what we don't know so far is how to do this with executables. And this is the reason no one does this yet. Because executables are not like a linear story of, of um, like a poem or something like that. Uh, executables are mostly just addresses. So they jump to each other and continuously jump to other memory regions. And if you change a tiny part of it, all of these addresses change. And this is why we can't do it with content addressable storage because um, because it, these won't match with another executable. The addresses are going to be completely different, even if it just changed hello world into hello something, right? Now, what we do with Bolter. Bolter is um, a completely new elf link group <laughs> that replaces GNU LD. It's completely written in Rust, and it's completely written from scratch. There is no GNU code in there, uh, nothing like that. There's no license infection. It's all MIT, all open source, open on GitHub. And what we do with that is we link executables in a way that they're globally the same, which means that if you link two executables, both of which contain the same static library, like a libc or a libopensl or something like that, no matter where you link it on Earth or in space, they're the same. Um, that allows us to deduplicate most of that code um, that is shared. Very similar to a music example, by the way, if you, if you have recognized that. Um, this is not unlike dynamic libraries. Of course, you're going to say that. It's probably a question that's going to come up. So um, dynamic library is a little different. Um, we have this problem called DLL hell. If you remember from, if you ever worked on desktop systems, back when they were relevant, um, we had this problem that if you, if you deploy shared code on a system, that the code that gets executed at runtime on the user's machine might not be the one that you're expecting at link time. Uh, because the user might have updated a different application that also needed a library but a new version. And your application code might be completely incompatible with that new version. You don't have any guarantees in shared libraries. With Bolter, we have this guarantee because we're linking by content. We're not linking by name. So when you link a libc, it is linked by its hash. And that hash is uh, the content as well is put into the binary. So if you have two different applications, using incompatible libraries, they're just going to be not deduplicated. They're both going to have their original libc in there, um, but with the with the version that they actually actually expect. And we're either going to store just one of the libcs or both of them, and we can also later decide to change that. Automatically, of course, based on, based on the hash of the content. Oh yeah, demo time. Okay, let, let's hope this works. Give me, give me all uh, your, your prayers. Sorry, come again. You're demonstrating an update on customer support? You wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, I gotta say with that, actually, we have uh, this not in production. We have, um, uh, I work at SuperScan Networks as a CTO, and uh, what we have there is 8,000 devices out there with a complete REST stack, but we didn't dare deploying this yet. So since I just got it working last uh, week, we're not that crazy, I hope. Okay, cool. So I prepared a little test here. This is this is just um, two test files, really. This is Hello World in C. Now this looks very simple um, to some of you who know C, probably all of you. Um, this is just Hello World, but in terms of what it links into uh, libc is actually pretty crazy. Um, you're gonna see that in a second. And oh no, it's not a library. And we've got Hello Two C, um, which is which is almost the same thing. It's just uh, gonna print the local U name, which is the name of the operating system we're running. Um, now. These two look very similar, and you would expect that the binaries are very similar, but if we link that with um, GNU LG, I, I'm gonna risk it and delete the binaries. Lucky me. Um, if we risk it, and uh, I mean, if we link it with GNU LD, this is, this is hello one, this is hello two, the LLD binaries are linked with GNU LD. Uh, that's a trick here. I could show you the make file, but it's not that interesting. Um, so, if you expect these binaries to be very similar, and if we looked at it from a content addressable storage perspective, they're not going to be. So I'm going to use Archon here, and I'm going to store... Actually, I need to make sure that my test thing is removed. 
or actually I just, um, give me a sec. I'll just use a different storage. Oops, you've seen that, right? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> it was too late <laughs> to tell me. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I'm just gonna store these both into a contradecible storage. And th this one was um, 17 kilobytes because it includes the libc with static linking. And I'm gonna store the other one and it's gonna try to deduplicate it based on um, something that rsync uses as well. Um, which is the BOP algorithm, it's BOPs, it's from rsync. It basically tries to go through a binary and, and try to find cutting points that it can use based on its content. It, it's basically also what CI sync uses or um, any content of a storage really. They're all very similar. So we've seen that uh, what we see here is that we we stored 17 kilobytes on, actually let me do this on the other screen, if we can reach my mouse over there. Uh, we stored, oh, this has so much input delay, I'm not gonna be able to do it. Um, we stored 17 kilobytes with one binary and the other binary, we still have to store 15 kilobytes. So we'll only be able to share a minor part of it between those binaries. This is because all of the addresses have changed. Now, if you do this with Bolter, uh, if you just, the BLD binary is linked with Bolter. If you just do this with, just gonna make up a random name here. Uh, I'm gonna store hello one. Um, also 18.44 kilobytes. You notice that this is slightly bigger than the uh, GNU LD by library. There's a reason for that, which I'm gonna explain in a sec. I'm going to store hello2, um, you're going to see that this is significantly better. We're only storing 5 kilobytes. These are, these are basically, this is what's going to enable you to do partial system updates in a completely safe way by deduplicating most of your application code that's shared between the two different binaries. Um, now the reason that um, the Bolter link binary is slightly bigger is because we, um, first of all, I just got the linker working last week, so there's a lot of optimization missing. But there's also an index into the content inside, which Arkan uses um, for, for cutting points. Like it's gonna know exactly which content is in there so it can compare it to any other thing it has already in the store. Um, this is something you would do in an embedded device, for example, from the outside. You would say, push this device, uh, push this image on there with, that's really not cool. Okay, glad. <laughs> I'm really glad this didn't show them in the other screen. Um, uh, you, could put, you could push um, content in there on, on an embedded device and it would automatically deduplicate it. Cool, so that, that's all the demo I'm gonna show you. I'm not gonna deploy this on a customer device, forget it. <laughs> Thanks for tempting me. Um, so let me just get back to my notes. Okay, so let me just do this first. Right, so I just wanna lose a quick word on Rust. As I said before, um, because I still have time, um, I ran Superscale, which is a company that recently got got sold, and um, we did Rust there. We we have an embedded stack for for almost eight thousand, could be more than eight thousand devices now out there, um, that runs on there. I'm really in love with Rust, especially because it's the first language really that that the first major popular language I gotta say, after C plus plus that allowed us to do something like this because it's portable to a micro, or really really small and embedded and constrained systems. And I really hope the community doesn't lose track of that. And, and really encourage people to, to keep thinking about portability in, in constrained environments. Now, um, where I'm going with Corhal is I'm trying to change the internet itself, it, internet of things itself from an engineering perspective. We need much better tools to deal with things like end of life clouds, service disruption, monopolized data infrastructure. And Corhal is a larger project I'm trying to set up. So if you're, if you're interested in Internet of Things infrastructure, specifically decentralized internet infrastructure that doesn't need a cloud. I'm gonna talk about that in another talk. Um, give a shout out to me after the talk or stalk me on GitHub or stalk any of my project members on GitHub and help me fix IoT. Thank you. I get. I guess we have time to take questions? Yeah. That's awesome. You talk what is your relationship with IOTA? <laughs> That's a nasty question. Yeah, um, <laughs> because because you saw the crypto incentivized network, and I'm not going to talk about that today. That's okay. that's still in secret. Yeah, too much money in place. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about money. Other questions? What if you are going to update one of your tools and that fails? 
uh, on the device there are no tools. The, the, uh, as you have seen in my demo, the binary executes on itself. It, uh, all, of the, all of the loader elements are inside the binary, just like before. Okay. You also don't need a specialized bootloader, actually, because everything's inside the binary. That also allows you to do um, something that I find really important, which is reproducibility. So if you if you put this on one device, and you and it works, you know, test device, you can be sure that it also works on another device because the images are going to be the same. Great question, though. And on the last slide, uh, point four, you said. Uh a direct device-to-device -device interaction, isn't that a high risk for an active attack? Um, that, that's going a bit farther than, than what, I, what I said here. Um, th this, is, this is not well thought out, i got to say, so I don't have a direct answer, um, because I'm not sure where you're going with this, um, especially because this is in the direction of the decentralized network. That I haven't talked about yet, but you're right. It has a risk of fraud. Um, this is why there's a crypto element to it that it tries to prevent fraud. But that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> Thanks for the question, though. Um, if I understood correctly, Bolter does deterministic linking. Yes. Uh, how do you solve things like static initialization order? And things that are not really deterministic in C and that um, the initialization order is is deterministic in a sense of if you have the same input, you're always going to get the same result. It's not deterministic in a sense of if you link something else. That's correct. Yeah, if you link something else, and the 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 order is going to change. That's correct. But it's not going to change in in the sense of that if if you have the same application, no matter what underlying code you share, it's still going to be the same initialization order, because that's not part of the runtime. At, at runtime, it's always going to be the same. In the TLS section, it's always going to be the same in your application code. It's not going to change because you don't link other code at runtime. Does that explanation make sense? Maybe maybe we can talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it later because it's pretty deep technical. Uh, but thank you for the question. Definitely talk to me about that. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert, but there's uh, something called ASLR. Uh, I think it's to um, replace most uh, pointers with uh, random addresses so that uh, an attacker oh. cannot uh, replace functions. Great question. Uh, wouldn't your uh, linker uh, go against it? Absolutely a great question. Um, this is this is address space run, address space randomization. Uh, this is to prevent um, break-ins when you already found a buffer overflow in an application that you can't just run uh, jump to a known address where you can execute code. Um, this is enabled by default in Linux. And the um, th the demo that you just saw those are with address space randomization. Um, the way we do it is um, the the global address space. Um, you see, it's shifted by the load base. So at, at run, what happens at runtime is Linux loads this at a specific address that it just randomly thinks up. And we just lay out the entire address base after that relative to that base address. Okay. This is how it works. It, it's, it's a bit fancy. I could show you the, the internal details, but it does not conflict with, uh, with, random, with randomization. Okay, thank you. Great question. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll have a five minutes break. Give another round of applause to Avid. Thank you. And we'll be back with our next talk then. Thanks.
All right, everyone. Um, it's part for. It's time for the second part of our uh, meetup. It's uh, Winston's talks about um, RSpec, making a BDD test framework in stable Rust, and um, I'm looking forward to it. And I'll give over to Winston.
Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, and then you can further um, nest those and have arbitrarily deep nested uh, tests there. And the interesting part is that these ones share the same setup, right? You don't, exp you don't repeat yourself over and over again. Um, and they can also f like fork, if you are right? So they could diverge here and here as well, but still share the same origin up here. And if you express this in some kind of hierarchy, then this stuff on the right would look like this diagram, this tree diagram on the left here, with the given and these two when clauses being those two, and um, these three being this subtree. And if you look in the Rust ecosystem for BDD frameworks, then there are um, basically three that I found that are usable, or that I found usable. Um, there's Shiny, which has a very nice syntax by using, by basically being a compiler plug plugin and using macros to be able to have a very nice DSL to define those, uh, those cases. The big downside of Shiny is that it's single level. So you have, you can kind of define multiple bags, but there are still bags. It's not a hierarchy of any kind. And you can define those before each, um, before each snippets, which then basically, like what Shiny does is it compiles down and is basically some kind of templating language, if you will. So. What it does is it instantiates, it instantiates initial, uh, individual test functions, which then are recognized by the test runner in Rust natively, and simply like copy and pastes those before each blocks into those test functions. So you get like, you're repeating yourself, but like the compiler is repeating for yourself. You don't have to do it manually, but still it's repeated all over again. And also, obviously, it also has to be executed all over again. Next one, there's stainless, which is kind of similar, also in, in, in syntax. Um, it's a bit more sophisticated. It also has these after each uh, companions, which are like behave similar to before each, just that are executed afterwards. So for example, what you could do is you could open a database connection in the before each and then close it in the after each in order to make sure it's, uh, you're not leaking anything. Um, and then you can have arbitrarily deeply nested contexts. The big problem here is that again, this is templating. So you cannot like define a behavior up here and then further use whatever is like, whatever you reached at this point of the current state and further specify behavior like add something to a set, then further add other op other elements to the set, and stuff like this. Um, you s the only thing you get is adding some structure to your tests, but it's just in the structure, not in the behavior. So we're not quite there yet. Um, also because it's unstable, right? I mean, the tests are the last part of my program I want to not compile. Um, so I always want my tests to be stable and to be to compile because like I don't have tests for my not non compiling tests. Uh, it's not tests all the way down. And they are breaking regularly. Shiny actually I couldn't get to compile today, so stainless does compile, shiny doesn't. Because the internal AST of, of the Rust compiler has changed. And again, you're limited to kind of shallow context, so at least at least from the point of behavior. And it's not actually code sharing because you're copy and pasting and it's also, again, it's executed over and over again instead of simply forking a certain state at some point. Um, and it has kind of an incomplete feature set if you compare it to what this Gherkin language should actually allow you to do in also in the expressiveness. So this is how this would look in our spec. It's a bit more noisy because we don't have the, uh, the benefit of a DSL because we want to be stable. At some point I would like to add a DSL, but it's right now, like the, the stable part at least has to be like this. So instead of 
inferring some some implicit context, we actually have to um, always like pass the context to the further down contexts to then further append them. So we add an it clause or an after an after block to the current context, and then in every further nested context, the context actually is the subcontext that's initiated here. And one interesting part is in the top, like this is a convenience runner. You can further specify how you want to run this stuff. This is just for convenience. And you pass an environment to it, and that's the fixture. And um, so, for example, if you were, I don't know, testing whether a number actually behaves like a number should behave, you would just like pass 42. Or you could have a struct which then also contains your stuff. And in some cases, like if you want to have some additional state, for example, if you wanted to test if um, the, the state after a certain action actually had a certain effect, then you have to keep both of these in this environment. So only stuff within the environment is actually accessible in here, which is, it is a feature, but it's kind of tedious in some points. So, and you only get access to the environment in certain places. So you get access in those before each, in which case the environment that's being passed into the closure is mutably borrowed. Same for the after, and then inside the it, you get the immutable environment. Within these, like within here, you actually don't have any access to it. And it, this completely ensures that you're not like messing with the data at places and times when you shouldn't be messing with the data. Um, because one of the goals of, us, of this project is to not only be efficient in execution, but also safe. You shouldn't have to worry about, worry about how your code is executed. You should only worry about the stuff like within these blocks, not like what's going on behind the scenes. So we are stable on principle. We have arbitrarily deeply nested tests and contexts. It is fully paralyzed in its execution. So thanks to Ryan. Um, but at the same time, it completely guarantees execution safety. So there's no way that one of those contexts could inf interfere with any of the other currently, or maybe in future, or whatever past running contexts, while still completely sharing any previously ran context, at least like parent context. Um, and it's rich in features, like it, is, uh, it has, has more, of the fe more features than any of the other two. Um, while still being extensible, and this is the current state is just like the beginning of what I would like to to make out of this framework. Um, it had been written the uh, the first version had been written by by Thomas, and um, then in a <laughs> shamefully large PR, which had like 227 comments and hugely reviewed, and um, I basically changed all the things like the name is the same the name is the same and kind of the api stayed kind of the same but like the all underpinning is pretty much completely ripped out and replaced um so uh, now it's a shared effort um we support three different um like language styles three different variants um my favorite is the given when then but you also can use any of these two other, and you actually you could completely change them. They're just aliases to, like, those right one, two right ones are aliases for the first ones. And uh, this would then either look like this in variant A, where you have sued context and example to to open those specific contexts, describe, specify it, or given when then. The execution of those is completely the same. And then you have before and after blocks, where before is a shorthand for before all, and after is a shorthand for after all. Um, and there's also after each and before each. The all variants are executed before any of the sub-contexts or sub-tests are executed. The each ones are executed before any of those individually. Um, unless you're actually um, using some, some shared state in an arc, these two don't differ 
from the effect. But if you have some shared database where you want to, for whatever reason, have one single shared one that's, that's hidden behind the mutex, then these would actually differ. But mostly those ones suffice. And again, what, what we do basically is by executing, by executing like these, these pieces of code, you then generate a data structure that looks like this, where you have the suite at the, the, suite at the top and then those contexts and further examples on the, at the bottom. And then we have a test runner that executes this. So this is the code that would then generate a structure that looks like this. So now to the internals. So every one of these nodes in the tree has a header attached to it, which then contains the name that we gave them in a string, and also the label. And the label depends on the, on the type of your structure. And as you can see, this is the only place where it actually matters which of these styles you choose. They're completely interchangeable. The suite then also itself it contains a header, the environment that you pass to it, which it's then hiding and only like revealing to you in certain places of the execution, and the root context. The context then has an optional header because the root, had, the root context is anonymous, and there's also an option for having anonymous contexts which allow you to, to further specify before and after blocks without polluting the output. And then you um, store each of these execution blocks and also further uh, substructures, which can be a block, which is either a context or an example. In case of an example, it's again a header and then also the function that actually does the evaluation of your test. And once we have this structure, it is completely immutable. And during the, the, the execution of the test is completely immutable over the, over the actual uh, code structure or test structure. And what it basically does is it takes, those, um, takes this tree as an input and returns a different tree. And it's a tree of reports. And those reports have the same structure as you saw um, before. Basically, you go from here to here. And like every time you enter one of these, you get a notification to, um, to your observers that you just entered some scope or left some scope. If you enter it, you just get the header. If you exit it, you get the header plus the report so that you can then like implement loggers, for example. So this is how you create a runner. You add your, your observers, which in this case just is the standard logger to the runner um, in a configuration which currently just contains whether the execution is parallel um, and something else which just slipped my mind, but it's not so important. And then also because this is kind of tedious to do this before every single like scenario, there also is this convenience function which just does it for you. And then there's this trait, which you can impl implement yourself. By default, we just provide a simple logger, which does co uh, console logging. If you wanted some, some structural logging using JSON or whatever, you could easily implement this yourself. And here you can see, basically, it's, it's, it's a visitor. It's just a like, more appropriately named visitor pattern. And um, yeah, the logger then implements this. And, uh, why we need this internal serial logger, we will get to in a minute. So this is how the output of such a test run would look. Um, in the actual console, the, those OKs would be green and the felt would be red, just like you're used to from Rust itself. Um, the nice feature is whenever something fails, you get the full path of those failures. And for example, if two of those failed at this um, yeah, at this hierarchy, then this one would be shared. So you would have those listed together here. It's not like you get all the stuff. Again, don't repeat yourself is the principle of this framework. Um, and then you also get like uh, test execution uh, durations. 
which are kind of like initially I thought like uh, yeah I'm also going to be implementing like timing so you can figure out which of those tests is is the slowest. But given that they pretty much all share those parent nodes, it's kind of difficult to figure out like what actually makes sense to like call a long te running test because like then pretty much all of them would be run long, uh, long running because they share the same bulk of setup code. Um, so right now we're only showing the the uh, total duration, but if someone has a good idea how to do this more intelligently to also give you with some reasonable semantics, like individual long running tests. So if there were some outliners, outliers, so you could like have a, have a further part where you just have like long running tests, that would be nice. Um, and then just like you're used to from, from Rust itself, you get this, this very short uh, statistic. So basically every block in a block in this case, like again, is the context, um, does this execution to figure out what's the result of the test run. So it basically does, it goes through its own sub blocks, iterates over them, then maps the block to its evaluation, which is a, re which is a result, passing at the uh, current context in its environment, and then simply collects those into, um, into a vector of reports. That's the serial execution. Then at some point I decided, well, I mean, given that most of this stuff or all of the structure is immutable, why not just try to make it parallel? So I did. Um, that's all it took, adding four, four characters, thanks to Rayon. And now you have like fearless concurrency, right? Because basically like you're running over this and creating a different structure. You're not changing anything other than the environment, but the environment, every time there is a fork here, you clone the environment. So the environment has to be clonable, obviously. You clone the environment and then pass those further down. But this way you have a very low memory usage. And also again, you don't have like, any calculation is only done once instead of n times like you would do in Shiny or in Stainless. So fully concurrent and fully safe because thanks to Rust, we know that there's no context can interfere with any other context unless you do some ref cell magic or whatever. And then, you, I mean, then it's up to you. Well, almost. Because the way I implemented the, the logger, this is what gets printed instead. Again, like you're, you're printing this part when you're entering the example, plus this, and then you print the OK when you exit it. But you enter several different contexts at the same time, potentially. So yeah, you get kind of like a knock-knock joke here. And the way we solve this, or the way I solve this is by having an internal non-exposed serial logger, which then is wrapped by a public logger, which reads out the configuration and whether it's parallel. And if it is parallel, then pretty much every of those functions from the runner observer simply nop. They don't do anything. Um, all of these have the have the comments, so it's not right, so it's still kind of kind of understandable what's going on here because it's kind of subtle, but um, only if it actually is serial, then it's actually doing something. And here it would be pushing stuff to the, to the buffer, to standard out, for example. The only part where it behaves differently is this exit suite function, where if it's serial, it just does its thing, but if it's parallel, then it actually replays the entire events onto its internal serial logger. And thanks for having the same structure from the code context and the same structure from the reports, we just walk the, the suite's report and like simulate uh, a run execution. So this is the report and this is the code for doing the replay. I removed some, some lines which are uh, not important and also the types so it so it still fits. 
Well, this is pretty much all it takes to make this thing uh, parallelly executable without any locking. Um, there, there is locking in the serial logger, however. And uh, we support four different kinds of types for matching. So you can either return a result, a bool value, or void, which always is a success, or panic, which always is a failure. And also, because I like to use expect test, uh, create for uh, very nice um, matches similar to the nimble framework in Swift, um, or similar to what you would be used from the Ruby R spec framework. Um, we also support um, expect test by the expect test compat feature, which then recognizes the expected result uh, expect test result type that's returned from those measures. And so the roadmap right now is I'm I implemented some very very basic timing, so you like just get the total time, so you at least know how long you take your, your tests took to run. But for the parallel execution, you don't get any progress, right? Because we do this, let's just ignore any result but the last one, and then replay. So what I would like to do next is to uh, add some progress bars um, for this, and probably even also for the, for the uh, serial one. Um, also, some kind of prioritization I'm thinking about, like um, you might want to execute long-running tests before shorter tests. Um, so you would have to to keep some statistics about your test execution, for example, in the target in the target directory, and then based on this reorder your uh, your blocks within the context. Um, and also filtering and focusing, as you might know from our spec, where you basically add a um, some prefix to your function. I'm not sure if I would like to use a prefix, but to add some kind of flag to your function to temporarily either focus on this particular test and ignore all the others or ignore this particular test or its context and all its subtests maybe. Um, and then even though the test execution itself is asynchronous, the tests themselves right now are synchronous. So I would like to be able to also support asynchronous tests, but I'm, I think this would be better suited, suited for, um, for an external crate using async matchers um, so that you could use it with like standard Rust tests or somewhere else. Um, and then maybe implement a DSL like uh, you, you saw for, um, for Shiny and, and, and Stainless, but which then would still have the same semantics as the stuff here. Um, I'm not sure how feasible this is, this is at least my plan. This stuff obviously would then be optional and not be stable, obviously. Um, and then also like in the longer perspective, I would like to um, uh, revive a uh, discussion um, about the extension of the current testing infrastructure because for this to be integrated into Rust and to use the default native test runner we would kind of have to like concatenate all those different levels of names like given when then into a long name and run this and you would pretty much lose any of the semantics and I'm also not sure how the execution with all this like logic sharing and execution sharing would would map on this so um this would probably need some some uh bigger discussion on how we would like to, to proceed with the uh, overall scope of testing in Rust. Um, yeah. And if you want to contribute, then please, please, please do. Um, there is uh, there is instructions on how to contribute, but basically it's just the, the common, common way of contributing in Rust project. Um, and there also is a tracking issue um, for all the currently open open things, which I think is number six here, which is at about 60, 70 percent. 
that I have tackled so far. So thanks. Any questions? I just started to think that using that, um, uh, what if in your context you have an entity like a database and then you have a parallel tests and you somehow want to share a transaction or something and I don't want to spoil my own code because of tests so I can, you know, share the same transaction or something. How do you solve issues like, you know, external entities in a context? So you would have to, to, to wrap this in in a mutex, in an arc, in whatever is appropriate for, for your scenario. Because right, the way it is defined, um, let me see if it's here somewhere. Yeah, so your T is the environment, and the environment needs to implement clone, send, and sync, mm -hmm. and also most needs to be debuggable so the test stuff can actually get some output. Um, so as long as you ensure this stuff yourself, you're free to go. Um, you certainly can use sh shared mutable state, but um, avoiding it, it's basically just you write your stuff and you simply don't have to care about any kind of intervene intervenes. Thinking having my project running, you know, every, every single uh, call does something in the database and you run everything in parallel. I just don't see it, you know, to be an easy, easily solvable in tests. So. Well, these wouldn't be running in, 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 in parallel then because they would be blocking. Mm -hmm, yeah. You would lose the parallel nature. Yeah. But then you can, in this case, you would just uh, pass a different config to your runner, which simply says it's serial. You would still need to provide those constraints, but it's at least then you wouldn't have any uh, threat contention or stuff like this. Hi. So I had a look at the RSpec some, some time ago. It wasn't that feature-rich at the time. Yeah, it's all in this one. It's all in this one PR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, <laughs> it just has, grew and grew and grew, grew grew quite a lot, and, and I really like it. Uh, two two additions. Um, there is already uh, one one Rust module with which implements the Gherkin language, but they don't do it with modules. Uh, they parse feature files, and I think they are stable. So maybe you can have a look there. Okay. And check if you can maybe interface with them. Yeah. Uh, second addition to the test frameworks, there's also the uh, Galvanic test framework. Okay. Um, it's split in three parts, uh, an assertion part. Uh, no, I was specifically looking for BDD frameworks. Like, yeah, I mean, there okay. are lots of other testing frameworks which are good. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't mean to say that none of these work other than these no, three, no. but for BDD, these are pretty much the only ones I could find that are actually somewhat usable. Yeah, the stainless is the oldest one, I think. Yeah. Interestingly, it still complies while well, Shiny doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So like this is this huge PR and it's like intensely reviewed and oh. What's happening here? So where's the Yeah, there it is. So like it's huge <laughs> and like it, uh, those are the two people, right? This is Thomas and me. Him doing reviews and me like fixing the stuff he doesn't like. <laughs> well, the thing basically is like, I, I mean, obviously I wanted to do this in much, lots of smaller, and that's also what I, what I wrote in the beginning, like consider this like one of many, not sure, but, um, I had to completely rip out the entire structure and then like replace it with something that's immutable and, and actually paralyzable. Because the way it was before, you couldn't you didn't have environments, you didn't have any kind of like environment sharing, environment forking, and this kind of stuff. Um so yeah, it was very limited before. You didn't have any before or after functions and stuff. Got another question similar to the first one, um, which is that I think you said that the uh, the con not the context the environment that is passed between the testers is immutable. Is that did I no? Oh, it's the, the environment is the environment is, is mutable, or I mean, it's just a type. 
Right, okay, it's any just, type you pass. It's just any type you pass. Okay, because, because I was thinking uh, something similar than the first question, because what we do is we do testing with hardware, so we do external allocation of test racks. And, and how we do it in BDD, um, at least before REST, uh, what we did is we allocate a test rack in one of the upper parent nodes and then pass that to the inner ones. Would, but would that be something that we can do that way? So let me just show you how, how this stuff is initialized here. So this is the like, advanced example of ours, and you basically are trying to test a B tree set. Oh, yeah, sure. So you try to test the B tree set and whether it like behaves like it should, and um, here you like define your initial state of your of your of your scenario. You pass it to the suite, and then whenever you want to do any further modifications of this environment, you have to do it within these before all, before each, after all, or after each. There's no other way where you actually have access, mutable access to this. You have access. That's actually, really good. Thanks. <laughs> you have access in the then, but this is just immutable. And like, so basically, what happens if you run this? Or maybe let's take the the simple one. So what happens when you run this is, you first, um, when we run this, we collect all those contexts. There could be code. You could write code in here. I mean, we, can, we cannot prevent this. But this stuff, interestingly enough, like gets executed before anything happens in here. Because we first create the stuff, and then in the end, when this stuff is, 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 is calculated and, and passed to the run function, then we execute the tests. So like, you could like, write an entire program and within these two lines, but the testing framework doesn't care. And then you just execute those in order. I'm thinking about like also alternating the order, so you don't, but it shouldn't actually matter because you cannot have any, inter any interference. It should be completely isolated whether, right? Unlike other testing frameworks where you wouldn't want to rely on the order of your tests. Um, and so this stuff is executed before any of these, and there could be several of those are executed. Same for this one. Would it make sense to grow the environment while testing, while stepping down the tree? So to extend it, you know, to create a stack of environments on top of each other while you traverse down the testing tree? So the question is whether you, it would make sense to, to grow the environment, to have some kind of stack. Um, that's pretty much what we're doing. Mm. Yeah, so... Oh, also, there's, uh, it's fully documented, so um, should hopefully be somewhat understandable for um, someone new to the project. Oh, yeah, my N key is stuck. <laughs> Fucking new MacBooks. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and my control key is broken, so that's, uh, I, need, I need to go to the genius bar soon. Um, so basically, you, you clone the environment whenever, um, whenever you, you, you reach one of those sub-contexts. Sub and um, you don't have like an explicit stack, but the core stack is your stack. So in the end, effectively, you do have a stack, yeah. So, um, if you do serial, serial uh, execution, then you only have this. You only have the current branch of your tree in memory. If you have parallel, then of course things can be a bit different. Uh, I have a completely unrelated question. Uh, are there some facilities for uh, auto-registering test cases if they are, for example, on different files? <laughs> yeah. So right now you have to. To ah uh, wait. You have to call this run function or call run on the runner. And there's no we cannot cannot simply like hook into this this test annotation stuff. Um, that's what I would like to be able to do. But for this we would have to extend the native test runner to accept like structural testing. 
um, maybe it could be one of those rare places where a singleton would make sense because so you could, uh, for example, uh, auto register yourself in an uh, in an array all, all the functions. They may have their airspec run in the function and then execute all those functions. So you mean like having a like a dummy test function which simply right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, or yeah, or, or you could just. Basically, what you could do is you could just like put this into a single test function, for which the name would then have like the actual name of your scenario. But this might interfere with the test logging and test running because we do our own logging, and we also that like, so you can you can run multiple scenarios at the same time, not not at the, in series, but you can specify whether it should bail out once any of these fails or whether it should continue and like log the certain failures or successes. But there is no way to easily integrate this. So right now you pretty much have to create a specific like binary target for running this. That's what, what I would like to, to fix by opening some discussion about how to make the Rust runner more extensible in this regard. OK, but sorry, can I, can I cut you short at this point? I think you probably should uh, continue the discussion uh, outside of the general forum. <laughs> um, is there a last, a final, very quick question? Or um, I think we can, is, is it really quick to, OK. Um, the parallelization, is it is a global setting, or can you enable it per context? Per context? Uh, no, you can, you, can you, spe you, you specify it in the config, which you pass to the runner. Uh, wait, actually, you have to. I think that's a good answer. Um, <laughs> you, it, it's it's it's. E I'm not quite sure. It's either per runner, or per per su suite. But in the end, it doesn't really make much of a difference. You can run several suites with one runner, but. All right. Thank you. <laughs> that was very extensive. Um, thanks for all the great questions. Um, sorry for everyone who's watching this live stream that we had a mic issue in the first minute. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming. This is the end of, of the talks. It's not necessarily the end of the meetup. I'll be around for a bit longer so you can uh, linger here as well and, and talk to each other and um, have some more food. There's still some bagels left and, and free drinks on the house. And um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, we'll have another edition in November and we'll announce it um, again a couple of weeks before. And um, again, if you want to talk... We'll, we'll not do a meetup in December, but if you want to talk in 2018, uh, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to arrange it. Thanks for being here. Ja, gerne. Wie wenn es um Sequenzen geht. Ich hatte immer jo. das Problem, dass ich bei den Applikationen immer irgendwie...